So my name is Frank Feldman. Um, I live in Singapore. I've been with Red Hat for uh, eight plus years now. Um, and my, uh, my current role is, uh, is a function we call the Office of Technology. We do two things in that capability across Asia Pacific. And one is we, we look after the field engagement uh, that our business units need to have across Asia Pacific. So we have three major business units in, uh, in the company. One is related to infrastructure, the other is related to storage, and then the application development platforms is another. So I have that in my team, and then the second capability is more related to the sort of upstream side of things, building out a, a CTO type capability in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, today I'll talk largely about management, uh, not the management of, of people or uh, people wearing beautiful ties and suits and stuff, but the management of systems, uh, processes, applications, and so forth. Um, I'll try to do this within time, so we may even have a, a bit of a, a Q&A if possible, um, and then we'll see how we go. All right. Um, before we, we go into the, the management side, I'd like to just quickly touch on something across the Red Hat story. Um, you know, we, we look at this a digital transformation thing that is happening. Uh, we all see and have many examples. You heard many in the morning uh, like it. We ask ourselves the question, what do you need as an organization to be able to actually take advantage or be ready for it, you know, either to prevent disruption of your own business in some form or way or you know, be the disruptor, which I think is the better position to be in. Um, we believe there's three pillars uh, that you need to invest in. Uh, one is on the infrastructure side, creating a much more agile infrastructure that will support the efforts that your developers are, are going to embark on. Some of those efforts may not be yet clear to you what you're doing. Um, so, you know, whether you're talking public cloud or on-premise or a hybrid uh, of that. I just on a show of hands, who here is, is using, you know, AWS? Can I get a... A few hands there. What about Google? Anyone using Google's compute environment? So a few there. And Azure, anyone using Azure? So yeah, I figured Australia is a very good blend and very early in, in those cycles. So I'm, I'm pretty sure if I ask, does anyone have VMware? I got a lot of nods too. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so we have a lot of on-prem and off-prem going on here. That's great. Um, the second part that we believe you need to invest in is, is the ability to codify a lot of the applications and services that you have today so that you can actually bring these things faster together, faster to market, uh, be it for mobile usage, be it for you know, maybe an ecosystem of partners that you need to integrate. I'll give you a quick example of that. In, in, in Singapore where I live, there's a company called Grab. They're like the Uber of Southeast Asia. Um, very cool company. Uh, they do some very innovative stuff. And recently they created a, a new way of paying for your taxi rides in Singapore. Um, they hooked up with Citibank, and they allow you to use the loyalty points that you accumulate on your Citibank credit card to instantly pay for the taxi rides that you do in Singapore using their app. Now, that is a pretty sophisticated thing, a new currency that they're basically adopting inside their app, and it meant connecting two companies' systems in a very real-time manner. Um, they could not do that if they didn't have some really, really good integration capabilities across both sides of these companies to bring that sort of service together. Um, pretty innovative stuff that I think uh, you know, many other companies or banks would, would die for actually to get closer to their customer um, like that. Uh, the final part is, is really about how you go about developing applications. The you know, culture that, that we have in many companies today around you know, taking an idea, developing it, and, and putting it into a you know, consumable way for customers. The whole DevOps phenomenon that we're hearing about and gluing ops and, and dev teams together in a way that, uh, you know, the marriage actually works <laughs> um, is, is something that you're going to have to invest in sooner or later to, uh, to increase the velocity at which you can take applications to market. So in all the sessions here, in mine and in next door's ones, these are the topics that we anchor, you know, the, uh, the portfolio around, right? Um, with that... Um, we're going to talk a bit about the, the management side of things and why that is very relevant in, into this thing. Um, it is extremely uh, interesting to talk about application development at this point because there's so much things happening in that space. But if you're in the other side of the house, in the operations teams, it's also a, a major, major worry um, because developers are making decisions faster about where and how they want to run certain things before you even have heard about it. And quite often in the ops team, people get, you know, 
a new application dropped on their lap and say, here, we finished it, now go run it for me in, in some form or way. And keep it running, by the way, and keep it scalable and all those sorts of things. So, you know, as a management team, people really need to take notice of the fact that this isn't just an application development problem. The way you manage your infrastructure also needs to evolve to support that rapid you know, delivery, continuous delivery. Um, I often look at it in the past. We, we designed our operation processes in a fashion for just in case. We've built all sorts of architectures for just in case scenarios. Um, just in case a peak workload occurs or just in case we actually need to scale the database for a certain you know, period of time. What we're seeing now with this rapid innovation on the application side, the operations teams need to start to think in a just-in-time model. How can I serve certain questions in a just-in-time? Because it's too expensive to keep doing things in a just-in-case model. The other part that we see in, in, in Red Hat, this is very visible, you know, we're just like any other company. We have an IT department. We have an extremely noisy user group because they're all engineers, right? And they know better than the ops guys how to do their job typically. Um, so th one of the main things we concentrate on in our operations is how do we reduce the steps for these engineers to do their job? How do we get out of their face whilst retaining a level of control and visibility that, you know, they're not crossing the lines too far from what we want? Um, and I think that's a, a key thing. You know, I was uh, meeting a customer recently, and, and they said, you know, when, when we have new application development, one of the rules that the ops team has inserted on the development team is every release of the application should have less documentation. Now think about that. Every version of the application needs to have less documentation. And the ops team said that's our only requirement from you because it means you're doing a better job at building the application in a way that we can repeatedly deploy. I thought it was an interesting thing for us even in Red Hat to consider when we sell a product to a customer. You know, if every version comes with more documentation, maybe the product didn't become easier for you to consume. Uh, so reduce steps but retain control um, is, is, a, is a key thing. And management really needs to embrace that. Management from the top, management from a software control point of view. Um, so how does Red Hat do ops? That's what this session is about. You know, where, what are we looking at when we build our portfolio? What components make up the Red Hat portfolio? Um, I think one of the key things that I, I personally experienced, you know, I have a, a four and a half year old son and a one year old son, and I never really spent much time thinking about this, but the way they are consuming technology, even at that age, um, and how that conditions them for the future when they look at how they want to consume IT, is a, is a mind-boggling different from me. Um, I, I actually think there's a certain beauty when technology creates a little complexity. I'm of that generation, you know. I enjoy debugging something. Um, I don't know about you guys. Who's got kids here? Okay. So I think you'll, you'll reason with me that your kids do not like debugging. They want it now. They don't have any time or respect for the fact that what they're getting is highly complex. And it might take a little longer than they would desire to activate it or consume it. Um, those guys, you know, they're coming into the workforce at some stage with that level of conditioning. And operations teams really need to take that as an example to think about, okay, how do we need to do ops next to accommodate that mindset, that level of, you know, flexibility. Um, containers and microservices is another indicator like that. You know, the developer community has achieved a much higher level of flexibility in how they package and deploy applications, pushing you know, a higher expectation on us in the operations teams to support that rate of deployment. Um, you know, much like my, my four and a half year old wants to have that YouTube video now, that's how the developer wants that container to be running now. Um, you know, we gotta make those sorts of things work. So we believe you can use some help. Um, in, in that. Um, so if you compare old world and, and new world a little bit, um, you know, in the old world we, we think in, in, in systems. Uh, who here still has golden images that you uh, maintain and deploy? Don't be embarrassed, it's fine, you know, it's, it's not a, yeah. So in, in the new world that we're seeing, um, that term doesn't exist anymore. In fact, an image is, is something you do not have. If you've codified your infrastructure the way you codify your applications, you have a process to go from source code to image, and it takes the entire golden image as part of that. So the OS plus the code and the frameworks and everything else, every time there is a deployment done, gets built purposely for that application. 
So the era of a golden image is disappearing, and we're getting into a disposable sort of world much, much more. Um, fascinating transition to really wrap your head around. Source to image is something you want to really spend some time on. Um, heroics, you know, I've, I've been in those uh, environments where uh, the ops team pulled a you know, weekend and you know, we were high-fiving and a crate of beer and everything else because we did something amazing. We kept something running. Um, that has to go away. You know, if we're scaling our business, we have to start thinking the heroics should be put into playbooks or something that can be scripted and repeated reliably, um, which is automation. All right? um, and we'll spend some more time on that today. The goal, ultimately, is to get to that experience my four-and-a-half-year-old is expecting, a frictionless interaction with the IT resources the company has, whether they're on-prem or off-prem. Um, and I'll use my son a few times in, in the analogies that we'll be going through today uh, to make, make that point. Um, so frictionless IT in an operations lens is three components. One, ease of use. Um, there has to be a low barrier to getting access to resources. Right? Get out of the way of the people who want to be consuming IT. So think app store terminology, you know, think self-service, call it what you like, but you know, the less the steps are to consume a resource for someone who's trying to build or deploy or do something, the better. Right? Um, fast meaning from the moment that I procure it, and procure is a bit of a, an abstract word, but you know, I, I say in the app store I want the app. Okay, the experience I get from that should be very fast. Um, I don't know about you guys, but if you, uh, you know, I did recently a, a, a flip from iOS to Android. I'm still not convinced about it, but I'm, I'm trying to really give it a go. You know, I bought a Google phone and said, okay, let's try this. So one of the first steps was migrating contacts, and there's an app in the iOS app store for migrating contacts. In fact, there's like 50 apps for that. So how do I pick one? I don't know. I search for it. I install, install, install. And within five minutes, I've tried six of these damn applications, of which one I actually liked, and the other five are already deleted from my system. So the time to value of the experience is very quick. Right? And we're going to see that for enterprise IT services as well. And modularity, the ability to put APIs or, I guess, instrumentation on top of all pieces that make up the operational architecture is going to be extremely important. If you want to do source to image and have the network capabilities, the storage capabilities, the actual compute and firewalls and load balancing and all those things as part of a built process, automated, you're going to have to have a very modular architecture. Um, if you're not investing or, or searching you know, in, in terms of knowledge about SDN and those sorts of techniques, really, really, you should be spending your time there because it's all about building APIs on top of these pieces of, of infrastructure. It creates that flexibility that you're going to need. So these three things are primarily what's driving our own R&D and our own you know, development around the management portfolio. When we acquire companies, these are the sorts of things we're looking at. Um, I, I went on holiday uh, last week. It was a public holiday in Singapore. My son, again, uh, as an example, he, uh, he brought his, uh, his iPad with him. And he, uh, he decided he wanted to watch some YouTube as we were, uh, you know, starting to uh, get, it, get in on the plane. And uh, it's the first time he's used the iPad when we're, we're away like that. And he wasn't aware that there's such a thing as connectivity that's required to use YouTube. So he threw a big tantrum, as a four-year-old does, embarrassed the hell out of me in front of all the other people in the airplane. But it made me realize that this instant availability and connectivity of stuff is, is going to be very important for these, uh, these, these, these people. So the four components in the management portfolio that we have, they try to focus on taking the steps out of the consumption and also preventive type things. And those, those are the two major spectrums, and we'll, we'll go through them. Um, any people here who know about satellite? Australia is quite a big market for that. So okay, I won't spend that much time on satellite because I think there's a fair amount of knowledge on it. Um, Cloudforms um, is, is a product that, uh, actually, sorry, Satellite is, if you want to manage Linux at scale, right? That's where Satellite is, is the key platform from our point of view. Lifecycle management of your Linux environment. Cloudforms is where we spend our time on building a single pane of glass. Think of the Harmony remote type thing um, for the pools of resources that you need to manage and apply, you know, role-based access controls and those sorts of things on, on top of that. 
This wasn't an invented thing in Red Hat. This was an acquisition that we did. Uh, Manage IQ was a company that was targeted uh, VMware workloads predominantly. We acquired them probably three plus years ago, I think. Um, we open sourced the code and started enhancing that with support for public cloud environments and Hyper-V and, and, and so forth. Um, Ansible, anyone here using Ansible? Yeah? Okay, Ansible is basically automation for humans. It's natural language expression of automation patterns of your infrastructure. Uh, we'll dive into that a little bit later, but it's an extremely powerful environment and it has a very large end user community that is sharing openly all the creative things they're doing to make their own lives easier through automation. Um, and then finally, uh, Red Hat Insights. I, I doubt there's a lot of people here that have heard of this thing. Uh, this is a very recent thing that we've put in. Um, think of, uh, of a movie um, called Minority Report with uh, Tom Cruise, remember that one? Where they have this magic thing, they can see in the future who's going to commit a crime, right? Um, Insights is sort of like that. It's harvesting knowledge from Red Hat's own support systems and upstream capabilities and then applies that through pattern matching using things like Kafka and others to see in your particular environment if you have potential risks or an outlier condition. And then it will tell you, hey, you know, based on you know, our minority report perspective, you might want to take a look at that box there because it could cause you some pain. Now, you can hook that in through APIs with things like Ansible to even automate preventive measures based on those sorts of things. Right? Again, trying to take away you know, some of the steps you mentally have to do. So we'll dive into each one of these. Now, let's start with satellite real briefly then. Um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with UPS. What does UPS do? They deliver a package at a very reliable way in a repeatable way. If I am a company and I'm going to you know, have a nice product that I need to get to my customers and I don't want to learn the art of distributing my product to your doorstep, these guys have perfected that. They are known to be able to do that in an absolutely reliable way. Right? Satellite is exactly like that to a Linux environment. Its job is to make sure that whenever you have patches or updates or some crazy ass emergency or other things that needs to be delivered, not to one, not to 10, not to 20, or whatever the numbers, but to thousands of machines in a reliable way, you trust this thing to go and do it. Um, we have had an interesting experience in the last couple of years. Um, shell shock was one of the major threats that many, many, many companies uh, encountered in, in SSL. Um, IKEA, do you have IKEA in, uh, in, uh, in Australia? You do? Yeah. I wouldn't have expected that, actually. <laughs> Uh, so IKEA is a big customer of ours. They got uh, 3,500 machines running, um, serving you know point of sale and all, all those sorts of things. Uh, so they were pretty uh, pretty scared with this thing, um, and they deployed in under three hours um, the shell shock patches that Red Hat had provided for them using satellite across their entire organization worldwide. Three hours, pretty uh, pretty nice UPS like experience, right? So Satellite really concentrates on that type of use case. It's the foundation, if you like, of um, our management portfolio. And it's the longest you know, product we've had in that portfolio um, for a while now. So full lifecycle management, part of configuration management is, is in there too, specific to Linux, um, and patch management and provisioning are some key use cases that, uh, that you should look at. I think at the booth we're also um, you know, illustrating some of that stuff, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. Um, compliance is another thing we've seen people use it for a lot, depending on which part of the world you're in. Um, Australia certainly has had a, a good use case for that. I can tell you in China they don't quite appreciate that part of the product very much <laughs> uh, for different reasons. But um, Who has this problem? There we go. You have a lot of remotes. Okay. All right. Well, I, I am one of those people that had that too. Um, and, and it's actually not me who had an issue with it. Again, I, I'm of the generation that appreciates technology, so I'm quite okay to have my Denon remote, which is the size of a book, and then the one from the TV that has, you know, competing for the number of buttons you can stick on 20 centimeters of plastic. But my wife is not of that generation and never will be. She hates it. Every time I change a component in my audio and visual architecture, uh, there's a new remote that comes with it and it causes a lot of pain. So her first question when I buy some new tech is, can I use it when you are not around? 
And that's exactly what happens in corporate IT when a developer wants to you know, consume something. Can I use it when Ops is not around to stop me, to play with it, and so forth? So we have a solution for that. Right? I bought one of these things, the Harmony Remote, which does a fantastic job at bringing all these things together. It's the single controller to rule them all. But this is what we try to do with cloud forms, a single pane of glass to have a manager of managers that you can put in place. Um, and these things are pretty advanced. You know, the, the basic user you know, typically picks the you know, named components and it has that you know, either through the vendor as a shipping thing or in, in Harmony's case, the community themselves. Right? You put the two remotes together, it learns from the other, it submits it to some website somewhere where, hey, if I'm not the first guy to plug it in with, with my, uh, my new device, someone else might have done it and I can just download the profile. So we're helping each other to basically make the lives easier of you know, our wives and, and whatnot. Um, <laughs> Cloudforms tries to really bring that level of abstraction into your architecture. Some of these can be scripted even. Um, I've done some of that in, in my case. So the ability to have standard and quick adoption of a single pane of glass, plus the ability to add some customization on the fly is, is very powerful. Um, if you think about cloud forms, if I can take in a bare metal environment and control that, if I can take in a virtual environment, be it VMware, be it Red Hat, be it OpenStack, be it Amazon, be it Azure, um, be it even Google, that's a pretty fast you know, array. And earlier, all of you guys you stuck up your hand when I asked Google. You stuck up your hand when I said Azure and you know, VMware and so forth. So you have a good use case for this. One of the key things we always get is, can you apply role-based access control across those environments? Have, have an abstraction, maybe connected into your corporate LDAP structures and whatnot, to have the right people at the right time have the right controls and, and, and abilities to execute on any of those environments? And the answer is yes. We have implemented that extensively in, in the CloudForms environment, which enables a very high level of self-service um, without losing control and visibility on what people are doing. Now, if you've seen the Spider-Man movies, there is a point in them where I think he's the father of, uh, of Parker. He says, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, I always think about that when I think about CloudForms, but it's with great power comes great policy. <laughs> you can have great power, but if there's no policy to enforce certain things that your company really needs to have enforced, either through regulatory needs or purely because of internal designs and structures you want to live by, that tool is a very, very disastrous thing. So the role-based access control features in, in here are very powerful. Metering is another thing that's in there and proactively doing things. For example, many, many customers who are adopting AWS or Azure and things like that they often find that there are quite a few instances running in Amazon that no one is using. You know, it's kind of like in the morning, I take a shower, I get out of the shower, I have my coffee, and I leave the shower running. Well, it would be kind of nice if your automation engine, the one that provides the single pane of glass, can detect that there's no one in the shower anymore, so let's just turn it off. Um, you can do those sorts of things with cloud forms and provide that through policy across those environments. Right? Pretty powerful way um, to actually pay for some of these things quite, quite quickly. Um, who knows which factory this is? Anyone? This is a Tesla factory, one of the giga factories they got for building Teslas. Now, Ford was one of the first ones to spend a lot of time on this robotic sort of assembly line stuff, and they took it a very long, uh, long, long way. But the robots in Ford's case were designed to do one thing. So you had a very long line, and then there was robot after robot, and then some humans who sort of changed stuff that a robot couldn't do. And Tesla said, hey, you know, that's very cool. We, we definitely want that. But what if we could design a robot that can detect and retool itself? So it will take off its arm <coughs> and plug in something else based on the task and what it's observing in front of it. So create a core of automation and pluggable modules because they don't know how they're going to design these cars. I mean, the latest version of the, fr of the frame of the chassis now has, I think it was 26 or whatever it was, built-in cameras all across the thing for that new autopilot feature of theirs. So they had to change the way they assemble and build the chassis. And you know, they didn't want to build the assembly line again and again 
And say, okay, let's build smarter robots, something we can adapt, have a core for automation, pluggable aspects to control other things in, in the future. That level of automation creates the ability to build an assembly line that is ready for just-in-case scenarios instead of, um, sorry, just-in-time scenarios instead of this just-in-case stuff that you saw in, in the other um, automation line of Ford and others. Now, that advancement is something we need to think about in, in software, too, when we're doing automation in our own IT ops departments. The ability to have a common language to describe what we want to automate and then be able to execute that at scale, reliably, and repeatedly. And this is where um, Red Hat invested in, in something called Ansible. Right? Now, before I talk about Ansible, um, again, I'll use my kid as an analogy. Now, he's unfortunately too young for this. You've got to be about 10 years old. Uh, but this is a, a thing from Lego, a Mindstorm. That thing in the center is a little CPU. And as a child, you can actually do what Tesla does with this thing. You can build your own sort of modules and have the CPU augmented with, uh, you know, I'm screwing, I'm clawing stuff and other things. Um, I'm desperately waiting for my kid to turn 10 because <laughs> dad wants to play with this too. But Ansible is exactly that, two components. One's called Ansible Core. It provides that thing in the middle, the CPU, the core logic of executing reliably and tracking the execution of things you automate. And then the second part, these arms and servers and other things, these are playbooks. These are the actual things you want to automate on a continuous fashion. Now, what Ansible does really cool, it has created a very, very large open community of people that write in this semi-natural language um, style playbooks. For example, I want to deploy Apache on a Linux machine in this and this way and configure it in this and this way. I want to have the network from Cisco Nexus or whatever um, orchestrated and configured in a certain way. There are thousands of playbooks in the open source community and you can describe anything from infrastructure to applications um, to networking components of this stuff. So we use it extensively to do things like when in the morning session you, you heard us talk about you know, the OpenShift deployment and the mobility deployments. With one button we want to stand up an entire um, pass environment that is auto scaling and ready to run you know, continuous integration and deployment on Azure. One click, give me a, an entire deployment of that. There are tons of Ansible scripts that we build for that, but we can now do that repeatedly and consistently every time. It's the same outcome. All right? Cisco is an interesting case. You know, Cisco builds a, a network function virtualization offering and a VI for their customers, and there are a lot of moving parts in that thing that they build. Every aspect of what they deploy is orchestrated through Ansible playbooks that they have developed for interfacing with their components and configuring this for a customer. Um, again, with great power comes great policy. So we said, okay, we give you the engine, we give you the actual playbooks. How do you know who's executing what? How do you know that the people that are executing these automation things have the actual right context, credentials, abilities, whatever sort of um, certification they give them to do this? So there's a second component to this, which is called Ansible Tower, that controls the Ansible Core Engine and the playbooks that you run and provides that level of authentication and user controls that you need to do this at scale. Right? Um, some of you may ask, oh, is that another GUI? Yes, it can be another GUI, but everything we do in the GUI, there is a perfect API for as well. Two reasons for that. Um, we need the API because one of the main tools that we want to use Ansible is Cloud Forms. If you say, hey, I want to create a new virtual machine, we will use Ansible automation playbooks to target Amazon or to target you know, whatever the environment is that you have to actually get that virtual machine created according to the specs that you have. Uh, we don't want Cloud Forms to be the one that actually has native understanding of those environments. Ansible is perfect at doing that, and it will continue to be far better at doing that. So there is both API capabilities and GUI capabilities for you um, to work with this. Right? Um, I highly recommend you look at this. It's very easy to get started because there's so much stuff out there from the community already. I will warn you, it's a little bit like cocaine. Once you use it, <laughs> you'll use a lot more of it as you start to, start to like it. So be careful with that. Um, finally, Red Hat Insights, the last component. 
Again, I'll use an analogy. This time we'll go back to one of the oldest practices on earth, the doctor or medical practices. Um, you know, mankind has accumulated a, a huge amount of medical knowledge over the years. Um, thousands of years, probably, we've been spending time trying to figure out this, uh, this body of ours. Um, Red Hat Insights is trying to do the same thing. We realized after 20 years of supporting many, many Linux environments that we are sitting on a lot of information that would benefit a customer from a preemptive point of view. If we could figure out a way to match certain patterns of a live system against the 20 years of experience, and there's multiple sources of information that feed into this, we could offer you a very proactive service that says, you know what, this may not be the best way to keep the system running. You know, think about the shell shock example from IKEA. We probably could have had an actual earlier warning or even an automated remediation plan proposed through this environment to IKEA and save them even doing that part of the work. Now, a lot of customers get scary when I tell them this stuff because they're like, oh, you know, that doctor's thing you have there, right, the stethoscope, does that mean you're going to be listening in on my environment the whole time? Uh, no, not in that way. So your doctor knows who you are. The way we do this, we do not know who you are. We look at the system, anonymize the actual characteristics of it when we match it against our information from two decades, and then we tell the system back, okay, here's what we think is wrong with you. Um, I wouldn't know whether it was you or you where the system is residing with. Right? Uh, okay, one minute. Wow, time flies here. <laughs> so this is the, the last part of the portfolio. So basic management um, that you find in, uh, in satellite for large-scale Linux environments, single pane of glass capability that you can deploy using cloud forms, extremely high levels of automation that are possible through Ansible, and preemptive you know, minority report style um, visibility on your infrastructure using Red Hat Insights. The end goal, of course, for us um, really is, I'll skip through this one for the sake of time, is to get to frictionless IT experience. Now, are we there when we deploy these four things? No. We definitely will have certain steps that will be clunky and whatnot, but we're getting damn close to having a very, very smooth experience in this. Um, if you want to know more about this, we run certain sessions that we call discovery sessions. They're a way for us to listen to what you may have as a problem or as challenges. It's not a product pitch in any form of way. It's for us listening, and sometimes we say, you know what, that's an awesome story. We can't help you. Bye. That happens. But most of the time, the discovery session is about us learning what you have and very specifically applying the pieces of the portfolio that could help you know, solve your, your problems and address it in, in a better way. So ask anyone at the booth about discovery sessions. They're very useful for you to get you know, started and figure out how to, how to really you know, move to the next level with Red Hat. With that, thank you for your time. And uh, you know, some links for you later to, to Google stuff. All right? Thanks. <laughs>